Welcome to the Washdown Podcast, episode 102. Tonight, James and I sat down and talk with Taylor Wilkinson. Now, Taylor was an EMT who became a paramedic, originally from Wisconsin, ended up in Seattle, Washington, and then all the way to South Carolina. So we had a great conversation, learned a lot of stuff. Um, so I really hope you guys can take away some lessons from this episode. Um, yeah, hope you enjoy it. Um, again, thanks to Taylor for, uh, coming on the show. Uh, like subscribe, all that kind of stuff, share it with people. So yeah, here's episode 102 with special guest Taylor Wilkinson. Still having, so it's recording now. Yes. Okay. Why didn't it's, yeah, we get confused. It's an issue. (laughs) <laughs> that's okay we'll figure it out together <laughs> <laughs> well see whenever we use our regular recording software we just hit the record button and it's immediately recording but with zoom yeah. you push the button and sometimes there's like a 10 second delay and it's not recording until it tells you it's recording so like we were doing you one you started and then you're like... yeah so we're doing one and we're like 10 or 15 seconds into a good conversation. And then all of a sudden you hear recording in progress and it didn't get any of what we had talked about. <laughs> Great. Perfect. So Taylor, right. wel- welcome to the uh, Washdown podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, why don't you start, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what your favorite color is, credit card number, all that information. <laughs> uh, well, my favorite color is teal. I'll start with that. Uh, but my name's Taylor. Uh, I, I'm a paramedic, still working as a paramedic, kind of, Um, but I grew up in Southwest Wisconsin. Um, I had a quarter life crisis at 23 and moved to Seattle because I loved Grey's Anatomy (laughs) and I wanted to work EMS there. And then I got there and after five years, I was like, "Mm, this is not Grey's Anatomy at all. Uh, So then I had my second quarter life crisis, which took me here to Charleston. Yeah, I'm not super familiar with that show, but I think it's set in a hospital. Is that correct? It is. Yeah, absolutely. But then there's now they have a spinoff called Station 19. Oh, yeah. I'm well aware of Station 19. Uh Terrible. It was like my weekly comedy show when I lived there. (laughs) Hollywood has done. I'm not going to get on my soapbox. (laughs) They've done more of a disservice to EMS fire, the police departments, the military, than any of the bad press that we could do ourselves. Oh, absolutely. And I've said that people ask me all the time. They're like, why do you think people are leaving EMS? And one of the things I always say is it's so glamorized. If you see it on TV or movies or whatever, it's so glamorized. Like, oh, we go out there and we do all this cool stuff and we're so badass. And like, that's just not how it is really anymore. And people uh, get it was it. never like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like this sucks. Like, I don't want to do this. Like I'm not doing anything cool or exciting. And they don't like, just don't want to stick with it. That's one reason I always say, like, I feel like people are leaving. What, uh, what got you into EMS? Uh, so just I said started... Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> Grey's Anatomy. No, <laughs> I was in EMS before I fell in love with Grey's. Um, I initially started out volunteering in a very rural community in Southwest Wisconsin, and I was working nights in a nursing home, I know, uh, as a CNA and my charge nurse. Oh, the arch enemy of the paramedic. Gotcha. Yeah. Yes. yes. The nursing never, home never my nurse, patient. I, I don't really work here. Yeah. Um, I've never the... seen this patient before. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the I classics. Like... Yeah. <laughs> I like to think that we were not at all like that, but maybe I was wrong. <laughs> um, but she she was a volunteer EMT and she was like, oh, like, come try it. We need people, whatever. So I went and did one ride. And my very first call was a child not breathing. And I was literally shitting my pants, if I can say that on here. Uh, I was oh, like, yeah. I'm not getting in that ambulance. You guys have fun. I'll I'll go on the next one. And they drug me in. And the whole time I was like, 
literally shaking. I'm like an 18 year old kid that's never seen anything in my life. And uh, it luckily was just a mucus plug in a trach, but uh, like we were able to resolve it fairly quickly. Not a big issue. Uh, but they like parents are at the door, they're screaming, they're freaking out. I don't know why, cause their kid had a trach, but I guess they had never had this happen before. Um, but they just like went in there super calm. Someone went and started reassuring the parents. Everyone else went to the child. And I was just like, this is incredible. Like we walked into absolute chaos and panic and within five to 10 minutes, everyone's like calm. There's no longer an issue. And we're like, have a good day. And went home and I was like, that was really cool. I want to keep doing that. Um, but, you know, rural Wisconsin, very low call volume, was not exposed to much. Uh, and then that's when I fell in love with Grays and was like, I'm going to go to Seattle and do this. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's one end of the spectrum to the other. 100%. Yeah. So My you- first. Were you, at King, were you at King County then? Yeah. Well, so I worked for AMR King County. Okay. Um, but we held the contract with Seattle Fire Department as well as some other area fire departments for all their BLS contracts. Or okay. I'm sorry, BLS transports. Um, so it, my very first shift was a downtown night shift. And I don't think my jaw left my lap for a week I was like, what is this what are these people doing like what is this place we're here uh we're here in the Kansas city metro area and um a lot of ems protocols and thought processes come are mirrored quite closely to king county they they've always had pretty progressive protocols that i think are pretty oh neat. yeah yeah it was uh i went in with three years of EMS experience. And I felt like I knew nothing (laughs) my first six months there. Um, it's was definitely a fast learning process. Um, and you really had to catch up and be on par with them very quickly. So left Seattle, went to the Charleston area. Mm -hmm. Um, tell me about your time while you were in Charleston. So I worked, I work for Charleston County EMS, um, which is fantastic. Um, I would never leave there to work EMS elsewhere. I said that from the beginning. Um, But huge coverage area, very high call volume, low staffing. This, you know, a tale as old as time with EMS these days everywhere. It's not unique. It's not anything that they're doing. It's just how things are. Um, well, can't get butts in seats. So, right. We had, you know, keep butts in seats. yeah, well, that's the, the generation before me has mostly gone away. They've all retired, whatever, but we didn't, and it's nationwide. We weren't proactive on our hiring. And then whenever you have the pandemic come along for two going on three years, you're not hiring because you don't know how to put an academy through or how to do this or how to do that. Well, you're still losing people because right. you got people that are going, I have had enough of this. I'm out. And now we're seeing the results of that nationwide. Absolutely. And that was the thing too. When I came in, I started at Charleston. It was June of 2020. So heat of the pandemic, right at the beginning, I got thrown into like a four day accelerated academy, essentially. <laughs> like, look, like we don't want you guys in here any longer than we have to. Um, so they, they use the metaphor, get ready to drink water through a fire hose, as far as like throwing protocols and everything at us. Um, that might be my new so- favorite metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what they used uh Uh, it's a less than effective method let's just say that (laughs) right right uh and yeah they're you know it's just you're pushing people through so fast to try to get people on the truck and get them ready and like you said but still more people are leaving than you're bringing in 
Um, and it's, it's everywhere. And, you know, the pandemic obviously added a lot of that emotional toll and stress and everything else on top of everything you deal with on a normal day. Yeah, that's for sure. You, uh, you made a post to your Facebook a few months back, um, talking about your departure from the career field. Yeah. To our visit, to our visitors, our listeners <laughs> that haven't read that. Walk us through a little bit. Walk us through your mindset. What led to it? Where you are now? What led to my post, or how I got to that point? How you got to that point, and what led to your post? Because you um, wanted to share that story because I think you probably knew others were feeling very similar to you as well. Yeah, and honestly, at first, um, I had it set just to like you know my Facebook friends. It was private, whatever. And a couple of my coworkers were like, "Oh, can you you know make it shareable?" I was like, "Ah, sure, whatever." And I couldn't even look at my phone for three days because it was just exploding with messages and comments and shares and everything else. And I'm still getting them, uh, you know, over a month later, but I don't, it, it's hard for me to pinpoint anything that I was like, this is it. I'm done. I can't do this. Um, when I init- when I moved to Charleston, I was still an EMT but I knew I wanted to go to paramedic school. So I like immediately jumped into paramedic school full time. I'm working full time. I'm working overtime. And I think it was just the accumulation of one. I was on a truck every day, (laughs) the days that I wasn't, I was in a hospital or I was sitting in class and it was just, I eventually realized, um, like I was not me. I, really didn't want to live anymore. Like I got to that point and I was like, this isn't okay. And then I was like, I just have to make it through paramedic school. I make it through paramedic school and I'll be fine. It'll be like so much less stress, but it's still, it was, it was to the point, like I didn't care. I didn't care about my job. I didn't care about my patients. I didn't care about anything in my life. Um, and I think I finally accepted that. And was like this, you know, I put on all this hard work 11 years later and I hate this. I don't want to do this. Um, It's, it's not what I wanted it to be. It's not what it used to be. And like, it has changed me as a person so much that I'm, I don't even know who I was before or what I was before at this point. Um, Looking back on it, would you call it growth or regression? I think growth really, um, you know, for me to recognize that in myself, I think takes a lot. There's too many people in the field that don't, um, and they're burnt out and they're poor providers and they make poor decisions and they're not pleasant to their patients. And I worked with plenty of those people and I hated it. And I did not want to become that person. So do you think there are steps that you could have taken along the way to I think get you to not be at that point? Like you could have handled some stuff better. Absolutely. You know, like maybe not work so much overtime or, you, you know, go. that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And yeah. that's one he's thing. Gonna, he's going to look at me right now and try and turn this back on me and I'm not going to acknowledge him. So please continue. <laughs> don't look at him. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I'm not here. If these aren't the droids you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. So no, um, but you, you, you raise a, a, a valid point and it's something that we've talked about on the podcast, a bunch of, we do a lot of this stuff to ourselves because of the mindset of, okay, well we're short staff. So somebody needs to work. Well, okay, I've worked 48 hours straight, but I'm going to go ahead and work that 96 because I know so-and-so is out on COVID or has a bum leg or whatever, but that ambulance needs to keep running. So I'm going to do it. So before you know it, but you're working every day, you're going to school every day, you're doing whatever, and you're not sleeping, you're not eating correctly, you're not working out like you need to. And all of that stuff takes a toll on your mental health. And it's, it's not something that you can just say, okay, well, I just won't work overtime anymore. You need tools in place, you know, because you got to fix what, I mean, I don't like to say broken, but you're at a point 
whenever you get to that point where it's not just stop working overtime and that fixes the problem. You know right. what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. And that was the thing too. You know, when I moved to Charleston, I was so excited. I'm starting this new, like this new place. I'm going to paramedic school and I didn't know anybody here. Um, I literally was here on vacation and was like, I love it here. I never want to leave. And I applied and got hired <laughs> and packed. I literally packed what I could in my forerunner. If it didn't fit, it didn't come. And I moved here. So I was like, I'm just going to work a bunch. I'm going to get a bunch of really good experience, like ALS experience and like really jump into it. And they just never start stopped. You know, I started school. I'm still working overtime. Um, not nearly as much, obviously, but I'm still on a truck all the time or in the hospital, whatever it may be. Um, and I think recognizing it sooner that, uh, that I wasn't okay would have obviously made a difference. And I know we have very good mental health resources through the county and I didn't utilize them. Um, I don't. Were they, so I don't want to get too specific, but it's kind of a specific question of was for your department, were those mental health services like front and center, like easily accessible of, Hey, if you're having a problem, it's here. Not like you had to go around the corner into an office under a desk to find the information. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I mean, there, we, there's posters up like at our logistics. So we did central deployment. And so there's posters up and stuff and they come in like during EMS week and talk to us. And, you know, it's always mentioned like, Hey, you guys have these resources. They're there. Um, but I also feel like it's, something that kind of gets skipped over too. It's not a focus when you get hired somewhere they're not like, Hey, these are the resources we have. This is how you go about using them. And it's not that at any point I could have reached out to someone in my command staff and said, Hey, like, I'm not okay. I need these resources. And I know I would have gotten them. And I don't know if it was just, I didn't think I needed them or I, I don't know why I didn't, you know? Well, because nothing was wrong. Nothing's wrong. I was fine. Yeah. yeah, I'm fine. You know, I'm done with paramedic school now. Things are fine. I'm I'm not gonna, you know, I have such a load off my chest and yeah. things are great. And uh they were not. <laughs> they were <laughs> I mean, not great. That's what that's what we do. We wait till the wheels are falling off and then it's like, oh, I might need a little help. Well, yeah. some, <laughs> something I noticed too, I think, Taylor, that tell me if I'm wrong in this. You know, we have, you know, Jeremy and I have the luxury here of having our friends here, our networks here, our, our families here. And we've said many times on the podcast that, you know, usually our job is the last thing to go. Um, you know, like if you look at somebody battling with addiction or mental health, whatever it may be, the job's usually the last thing to suffer after their marriage, friendships, things like that. You didn't have that there, did you? You were, no. you, pre, you, you didn't have a significant other family. Pretty much any interaction with your people was probably through FaceTime or phone, very limited. Nobody really knew you to see you to call you on your bullshit, did they? Right. No, no. And that was the thing too. Like I came into the system, everybody else is already so overwhelmed and so mentally taxed and like stretched thin. And I just like get thrown into it. So yeah, no one, no one knew me well enough before to realize or see that difference. Um, I will say, so my partner, my last partner that I had, we were partners for about a year. And even he was, I mean, even in that time, he noticed that change in me and he's like, you're done, you're done. And I was like, I'm done. You're right. But then began the battle of, okay, well, what do I do? How, you know, that, that was another thing too. Even after I realized I'm done, I'm like, yeah, but I can't do anything else. This is all I've done since I was 19 years old. Like what, what do I go do? I don't know. I don't know. I have no other skills. <laughs> what, uh, what was some of the feedback you got throughout your, when your post started going viral? Um, pretty positive for the most part. I would hope. Yeah. Yeah. Overall, um, I would say 99.8% was positive. Um, 
a lot of messages from people and every single one said almost the exact same thing. Hey, I know I don't know you. I will never meet you, but I just want to tell you how much your post has like affected me and I feel it and I understand it. And that's exactly what I'm going through right now. That's almost every single message said that. What was some of the negative? I, I know it's obviously not fun to think about, but was it coming at you from a point of weakness or laziness or people that hadn't addressed burnout themselves, maybe you think? Yeah, so, and eventually I couldn't keep up with the comments anymore. I tried at first and I, I couldn't after 9,000 some comments. I haven't seen probably half of them. Um, the few that I did see were all pretty much again the same, just like, oh, suck it up blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, you know, you need to be tougher, stuff like that. Like quit whining, quit being a baby. This is what EMS is. And it's not. And that's what drives me crazy. It shouldn't be. You know, that's, that's a point you said, they say, this is what EMS is. You're right. They're both right. You're right in saying it. You're right in saying it shouldn't, but they're right in saying it is. Right. Exactly. Well, and I think, this is my own opinion. Um, but a lot of people making those comments probably at the height of their career before we're running five calls a day, 10 calls a day, whatever. And now people are averaging 20 plus. It's different. It's different. And it's not, you know, yeah, not every call is life and death, but it's still, you're running 20 plus. Yeah, you're still out there. You're, yeah. you know, you're still interacting with people. You're still trying to convince people like you're not dying. You're okay. You yeah. know, it's just like mentally, it's it's still taking away from you constantly. Even if it's not like a clinically challenging call, it's still like you are putting yourself into that call. I've, I um, found myself more, oh, sorry. No, I found myself more, I think, that not clinically challenging calls are the exhausting ones. The hard yeah, ones are, you're like, the hard ones, you know, and you get it, like, as the medic, it's what you train for. It's an algorithm. You go through a process. If this, then that. Like, literally, you're just like, I got this. It's like a code. Like, the easiest part of a code is working the code. It's a shit show when I get a pulse yeah. back. But, yeah, absolutely. But, um, you know, I, I've noticed and we've been doing this for what year and a half now. And Jeremy's noticed a lot of times the burnout, at least I've seen in myself is not my performance when it's most needed on the critical calls. It's the, my ankle hurts for nine weeks at three in the morning. Oh, you've, <laughs> you've switched it up from the 2 a.m. Toe pain. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I, and I that, just fucking had it two yeah. weeks ago. <laughs> that was one of, you know, my biggest things. And I've said that too. It's not, it's not the sick patients. It's not the tra- like the serious trauma patients. Give me 20 of those a day. Like, yes, yeah. I'm still going to be burned out. I'm going to be really tired. But like, it's so much more mentally exhausting when I have to go pick up the same patient for the third time this week for the same abdominal yeah. pain I've had for 10 years. Like, yeah. It's people that are abusing the system and there is absolutely nothing that at our level that we can do about it. And I think no. that's part of it is that frustration is boiling over and making everything so much worse. I've posed the question to Jeremy on this podcast and other guests before about is a career in law enforcement, EMS, fire department, truly sustainable for 25 years. And I, and I bring it back up tonight because of a point you said, like, give me the shootings all day. I'm fine with that. You, you, as well as me, as well as Jeremy, we thrive in chaos. That is our happy place. We do well in it, but that's not healthy. (laughs) No, (laughs) normal people aren't like, Oh, I've got this. This person's shot in the chest. Great. Easy. Let's do it. You know, normal people don't thrive in that environment. Yeah. Like it's, it, it makes you like, it's one of those things where you're like, God, give me the shit. Okay. Well, that's great, but you're not supposed to sustain it for that long, but I can do it. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but here, here's what I'll say to that. I think it, I think personally, I think you can do it and it is sustainable if you take the steps to make it sustainable. So you take care of your mental health, you take care of your physical health, you get enough sleep, you, you know, you eat right. You do all of those things 
And then is it going to affect you? Absolutely. It is that that is you will not be the same person when you retire at 25, 27, 32 years that you were whenever you came on. Doesn't mean it's going to be worse. Doesn't mean it's going to be better, but you won't be the same. But right. if you don't take those steps, which is what we're seeing by and large, I, well, I won't say by and large, because I think that a lot of the younger generation that just coming on one, two years, three years, four years, I think they're more open to taking those steps. So maybe they won't have the problems going forward that a lot of us older people do. I can say that. I don't know if that's a fact, you know, well, and you know, I think obviously just recognizing that mental health is a real thing. Um, and yeah. it's being more accepted and, and seeking help isn't seen as such a weakness as it was maybe even 10 years ago. I think that does make a difference. I think for me, I got so far into it that I didn't know how to sleep and eat right and exercise. And, you know, it was just like, nope, I'm like, got to be a paramedic, got to be a paramedic. I got to work. They have all these open shifts. We need trucks filled. Like, and I didn't, I didn't know how to pull myself out of that. Yeah. Well, that's so I, I couldn't take care of myself. Yeah. Well, and that goes back to the self-care and, you know, being aware of that early on. So you want to set your people up for success, right? So that should be day one of whenever a new person comes into the career field of, Hey, these are what, this is what you're going to face. These are the steps you need to take, or these are some things you need to do and you need to make sure that you do them. And we need to be hammering that point home. Whenever we get people in the Academy, whenever they're brand new coming out, that's, that's something that we can't skip over. Right. You know, and it's, it's being skipped over. Yeah. And again, like I am not at all blaming my department at it by any means. Um, and it, you know, again, it was mentioned, Hey, you have these resources. Here's a little flyer about them. Some little cards you can take, but like, those are, that's box it really checking. no one. I, and I think it would have made a difference had someone sat me down at some point and been like, are you okay? Cause when I still get that, asked that question, I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm not okay. I'm trying to be, and I'm trying to figure out how to be, um, now that I'm like at a place that I feel like I can try to figure it out. Um, but there's, there was never that person for me to be like, are you good? You know? Yeah. That's, uh, well, that goes back to, uh, and when I use the term leadership, I don't mean necessarily administration or people in leadership positions. I'm a big fan of leadership at all levels. So it could be another EMT, another paramedic, another firefighter, whoever. Because let's just face it, we basically live with each other for at least a third of our lives. So look at the person that's sitting across from you and go, hey, are you okay? And actually be invested in the conversation. It's taking care of each other. We spend so much time focused on our patients and on our citizens and all of that stuff. We let, we put ourselves on the back burner and that's really probably part of the biggest problem is we don't take care of ourselves because we don't feel like, well, this is my job. This is what I signed up for. But it's like, if you're running a car without oil, how long is it going to run? You know, you got to change the oil. You got to put gas in it. And if you never put gas in it, then it's going to burn up and burn out. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, why are you attacking me? I, I'm not yeah. attacking you. I'm not. I'm not. I, I no, promise. And if it's coming off that way, I apologize. No. I am not. Uh, I not just, you know, it's one of those things and it, it burns me up about him and how much he works and how much he does. And we've had the same conversation so many times of, dude, you, you, you can't go a million miles an hour all the time because eventually you're going to hit zero miles an hour and that stop is going to hurt bad. Taylor, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. I know why you became an EMT. You made, you made that clear. 
Why did you become a servant? You want my honest answer? Mm -hmm. I didn't. That's not, that's not why I got into the field to be, I guess here's, and this goes back to me feeling like EMS is so much being at just these helpless people at their beck and call. And, and that's not why I got into this. I didn't get into this to take you again to the hospital for the third time in three days for the same thing. I am not here to coddle you and baby you. And I didn't, I didn't get into it for that. I mean, I think I got into it initially too, like the adrenaline. This is cool. This is fun. Um, I, I didn't sign up to be a servant to helpless people. Fair. I want to help people that want help, that need help. Um, I, and I think that was another thing too. I don't think I ever thought that I, that this would become my life, that this is the only thing that matters to me or that I'm invested in or that I want to put time into. And then I realized that is all my life is, and it's not what I wanted it to be. If you were to do it over again, if you were to write a letter back to 19 year old Taylor, what would you do? I'm happy that I did it. I, I don't know if I would ever tell myself not to do it. I think I would tell myself to do your best to keep that work-life balance. Don't make this your life. Um, you know, there, there is, there is something outside of being on an ambulance. Um, I yeah, would still do being on a fire truck. <laughs> I, know. I am not built for that. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I would never, I would never not want the experience and the things that I have learned and, you know, and done like, the, you know, again, people don't typically thrive in chaos. People aren't typically put into that chaos time and time again. It's kind of cool. Um, but I think I would tell myself to like, take care of yourself, um, sleep, eat right, like realize before you get so deep into it that you need to make a change before you can't make a change in this field. You know, I got to the point that I felt my only hope was to leave. Would you let your kids do it? 20 years, 30 years down the road? Mm. Yeah, I think, I think I would. Um, I, again, you know, knowing what I know now would probably say on top of them about like, Hey, are you taking care? Are you okay? Are you taking care of yourself? Um, none of, no one else in my family has ever done EMS. I'm the first one. You're the black sheep. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. In many <laughs> ways. Um, but you know, I, again, I, I think I've learned life skills and just things in EMS that I wouldn't get anywhere else. Um, but I don't, I wouldn't take it back. It would be hard to watch one of my kids put themselves through it. Um, but I guess knowing what I know would maybe be more comfortable with it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like I know the signs to look for because I've been through it and I've watched my coworkers go through it. My friends go through it. Um, yeah. So what are you going to do with those lessons that you've learned? What are you going to do going forward? I still don't know. I, I've, been having this crisis since I got off the, so I'm still part-time on the truck. It's like a toxic relationship that I can't like fully leave. I know it's so bad for me, <laughs> but I like still need it a little bit. Um, so I work like three shifts a month. Um, and I'm working as a paramedic in an occupational health clinic. 
I'm like, it's super easy and it's low stress. And like, I work in nine to five, I'm home at five 30 every night. Like I'm really enjoying that structure and like just trying to get back into a normal routine of life. Um, like I'm still definitely working on that, but it's obviously not what I want to do. And I'm currently going through that crisis of like, well, what am I going to go do? I still don't know. Um, I don't know if I even want to stay in healthcare, but I'm like, I don't know if anything else is even interesting to me. Yeah. It seems like usually one of two things happens, at least from what I've seen is people either will leave and go to a different department or municipality and do the same thing for a little while. And then, you know, whatever, sometimes a change in scenery is enough for them or whatever. And then sometimes it's people will leave and they are completely out of the career field and they're doing truck sales or yeah, it's driving a forklift or or whatever, you know, it's something totally different pick head lice out of kids. <laughs> One thing I thought about, it's like $35 an hour to go comb lice out of kids' heads. I was like, yes. <laughs> sign me up. How is that even a thing anymore? I, 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 clearly, I don't know. It, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Not an issue. I, uh, yeah. 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 And, I, and I said, you know, once I started coming to the realization that I did not want to do this anymore. I thought about other departments. I looked around. Um, I looked at going to a fire department, but working as a paramedic. And I was like, I don't want to leave here to go do this job somewhere else. Um, I love Charleston County EMS. I still do. I just don't love the job uh, anymore. And so, yeah, that's, that's still where I'm at. Like, I I don't know what I'm going to go do. I really don't. I mean, at least you're honest, though. Like, yeah. You know, we, we've talked about, you, you know, we've had guests on before, and Jeremy and I will talk about afterwards, like, you know, they got it together, or they're not quite there, or they're still on their journey. And, you, you know, with you, it's you're still on your journey, but you've acknowledged that you're still on your journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. No, that shows a... a incredible amount of self-awareness because we do have you know i've had conversations with people and it's it's pretty easy to see when they're bullshitting and you know when they're not because the easy thing for you to do would be able to you know come on here and we ask you well what are you going to do what's next and you're like oh well i'm gonna work at a surf shop and do you know just come up with some flipping answer but you know, I appreciate the honesty of, I don't know. So yeah, I've considered a lot of things. I've looked at a lot of things in healthcare and not in healthcare. Um, I don't know. We'll have you back on in a year and maybe we'll see her and she like have dreadlocks and she's like, <laughs> I teach surfing, man. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, I like to have a tiki bar down on the beach now. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. I, I've honestly said that too. I'm like, man, I just want to like, go work in some beach bar and like make a boatload of money and tourist tips and like not do anything else. And I don't know why I don't, uh, I haven't yet though. Um, well, yeah, from my perspective, that's not a career. (laughs) That's just a temporary job. It is. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, it's not going to be as it's not going to be as toxic for you as what you have now. (laughs) Yeah, it it sounds really nice, but I also know, like I and and that's the thing. Partially, I think EMS has ruined me. Like, what else will give me that like sense of self purpose and like being fulfilled in what I'm doing with my life? I don't yeah. know. Well, um, you know, I think the the important part of it, and we kind of talk about this with you know therapy in general, is to keep searching for it you know, you, you're probably going to have to try multiple things. Have you considered buying a Jeep? <laughs> Just don't. Mine's been in the shop for a fucking month. And it, they told me today, we're going to start working on it tomorrow. What? Mine's been in there for two months. I don't want to hear your, I well, don't hear your shit. <laughs> yeah. Yours has actually been in the shop 
24 of 25 months. Yeah, it's it's real nice. It has such low mileage because it gets driven like two months a year because it's in the shop. Yeah. Well, yeah, I used to have a Jeep uh, in Wisconsin, actually. Well, at least you so need it I there. Went that. Yeah. Yeah. Are you burnt out? Yes. Have you bought a Jeep? Yes. All right. You're good. You've graduated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, the uh, motorcycle. Yeah, I guess <laughs> oh, next God, is no. motorcycle. Yeah. You cannot put me on two wheels. Mm-mm. So, but anyway, back to my point. It's it's going to be something that probably you're going to have to try a lot of different things. Or, you know, who knows? You might get lucky and the first thing is what you love, but that is hard. And that's a lot of my friends who spent a long time in the military that got out. And that's one of their big things is, not being able to find something with that sense of purpose and camaraderie and makes them feel fulfilled and all that stuff. So they're just still searching, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm getting, I'm going to be finishing my degree in January. I have two classes left that I just like mentally could not bring myself to finish before. So I'm finally finishing it. And then I'm like, okay, do I go get another one? Like, what do I do now? Um, so yeah, I'm Van Van Wilder was a professional student. So, I mean, the word (laughs) idol, the the word idol is not a friend of yours, is it? Mine, the the word idol, you probably, it's the same as me. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I was about to say hello, pot. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, I feel like I'm just like constantly chasing something. I don't know what it is though. If, if I do catch it and figure it out but um have you tried like, medit have have you tried meditation no you <laughs> should <laughs> it might be good for me uh yeah i i highly recommend it being able to sit and just be see, is, and uh, i like i don't know how to do that ever even you can't see my legs but they have been like Moving a million miles. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Um, I don't. Yeah. It's like, I don't know how to get out of my own headspace enough to be able to do that. Not yet. I'm hoping to get to that point. Yeah. Well, I'm like, you know, so used to like for so long, we just go, 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 go. That I'm still trying to figure out how to. Well, for sure. Yeah. Well, it's that goes back to that train metaphor of, you know, you're going along million miles an hour on that train and eventually the tracks run out so the ems track has run out for you and now it's time to do something different so but i would definitely uh look into doing that um that might help yeah meditating um any anything where you're you're sitting still and it's quiet it can be very very beneficial especially for someone who is who is like that, who is always on the go, always on the go and always busy doing stuff, being able to sit and just be with yourself can, uh, yeah, (laughs) can be very, very beneficial and it can help you clear your head, you know, get you thinking about things in a different perspective. Yeah. I'll tell you this though, Taylor, for someone that tried it, it is not a, at least for me, it is very hard to slow down and reflect on things that you aren't always proud of or happy of. And I know for for me, the quiet sometimes is my enemy that I made myself. Yeah. So I'll I'll caution you, if you ever do try it, you are not going to have a good time the first few times. Good. To, thank you. Well, if you're like me, that that's, that's your me. experience yeah. of it. You could have a totally different experience of it, sure. but, and then a lot of people, it's terrible. Have, you'll cry and you'll just want to jump off the train. It's, it's terrible. Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> And here's the it's other like my thing. Every Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a bunch of different types of meditation. I would encourage you to do your research and find what works for you or ones you're interested in trying, but it's not like you have to sit for an hour, you know, it's five minutes, 10 minutes, yeah. you know, something to get that ball yeah, rolling. I, 
you know? It's, it's yeah, I find myself constantly like, I I have to be doing like two to three things at a time. And it's like, after a minute of sitting, not doing anything, I'm like, okay, well, now I have to think about things. I don't want to do that. Uh, let's find something else to do. <laughs> um, are you, uh, are you talking to a therapist? No. And I know I still need to. That's um, going to be, yeah, I would highly encourage you to definitely jump on that. And the sooner the better. Um, if it's in your area, like it is pretty much everywhere else, um, wait times are ridiculous. Like my wife is a counselor and she's booked out January, February, you know, yeah. it's not something that it's just, you pick up the phone and you get right in most of the time. Um, right. but yeah, definitely. I would, I would start that ball rolling if I were you, because it will help, you know, it, it really will. Having and I a know professional, that. you know. And I think part of it too is like me still being like, no, like I'm going to be good now. I'm going to be good. Um, I like went off my antidepressants and I was like, nope, not good. Not good. It goes back. <laughs> wow. How many times <laughs> have you had that conversation with a patient? <laughs> oh, so, so many times. And yeah. I have had it with myself more than once too. Uh, so yeah, I'm like starting back on those and I'm like going to the gym again and I'm trying and actually, um, one of the firefighters from one of our local agencies had reached out and they do meetings once a month for first responders and invited me to that. Unfortunately, our last one got canceled because of hurricane Ian. Uh, so I haven't got to go to one yet, but I do plan on at least getting that started. Um, no. I, uh, I, I, I am like accepting that I need that one-on-one -on -one therapy counseling, uh, help me kind yeah. of thing. Well, and I would definitely, I would encourage you to do the group thing too, because it seems like with a lot of us, it's, uh, we get this mentality of we're the only ones who've ever gone through any of this stuff. There's something wrong with me. Everybody else is fine. And yeah. then you go set in a group of firefighters, cops, and everybody's telling a different version of the same story, you know, and it helps to normalize it. And, you know, there's a lot of benefit in that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely excited to be able to go um, since I was not able to go to the last one, but stupid hurricanes. <laughs> I just watched a Joe Rogan thing. I was, had a climate guy talking about hurricanes and how they're not as frequent or they're more frequent, but less frequent, but less strong, but more strong. I don't know. I was super confused. Uh, you, want to, <laughs> you want to talk about, so the girlfriend and I planned a trip during Ian. We were, uh, we were down in the Gulf shores and we were going to ride over to Destin. And then oh. I looked and it was like rain in the forecast. I was like, Oh, let me look at the radar. Shows how much I pay attention. I'm like, oh fuck, that's an actual fucking hurricane. Holy shit! Yeah, <laughs> like, like yeah. Fine. I thought it was like spotty showers, not a fucking actual hurricane. Yeah. I'll wear no, a helmet. It'll be fine. I don't recommend coming here like September, October. I yeah, think I November's hurricane season two. Uh, yeah. but it doesn't snow, and that's really it. Doesn't get really below like 20 um so i will take hurricanes for a few months to never have to look at a snowflake again <laughs> um i 100 percent agree with you well see here in the midwest it's it's a toss-up the only thing we don't get is a hurricane you can get a tornado you can get snow yep. you can get a snow nado um <laughs> we've had thunder snow. thunder snow yeah it uh I have that in wisconsin all the time yep <laughs> it's just <laughs> yeah just a and it's big... like super miserably hot in the summer and like extremely frigidly cold in the winter. Yeah, it's like, not that it's hot. Here. It's the humidity that sucks. Oh, go it's fuck yourself. Humidity. <laughs> there is it's no not humidity. The cold, here. It's the wind. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not, it wouldn't be. So you get all the Midwest shit, like oh, yeah. oh, it oh, wouldn't yeah. be that bad if it wasn't for the wind. wind. Oh, <laughs> all the time. Yeah. So uh, I I grew up in Louisiana, so it is uh, not humid here. And oh it, yeah, yeah. Like it, yeah, now it's like seventy percent humidity. Oh, it's so bad. 
<laughs> yeah, no, it's 120% humidity and 97 degrees. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. but at least here, like, you know, that's what you're getting all summer, right? Exactly. In the Midwest, like, like Jamie said, it could be, it could be snowing in April. I don't know what's happening. It snowed on Cinco de Mayo a few years ago. No, nope, it's, that is it's, not. It's literally Midwest. snowed and I rode my bike in the evening before. And it's nice. Yeah. Like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I can't do that anymore. I'm in, I'm like a house plant now. I need sunshine and heat. stability. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I need to know what's coming. Hurricanes. I have days to plan for tornadoes seconds. <laughs> Taylor, did you, um, in the last couple of years, did you find yourself turning to anything to help cope at all, did you have any issues you noticed with alcohol or eating or anything that looking back, you're like, oh, probably could have done that differently? Oh, I'm a food person, 100%. It is one of the few things that brings me joy. Um, <laughs> and, and you know, I used to be a big drinker. I'm not anymore. Uh, I was a smoker. I'm not anymore. Um, so it was food. That's definitely what I turned to. Um, and it, that's another thing, too, that I'm finally... And I would say even within like the last few weeks, I'm like, wow, this is an extremely unhealthy relationship and obsession with food because one, it gives me something to do. I, all I have to do is sit here and think about eating this food. That's it. I don't have to think about anything else. I don't have to do anything else. Um, and you know, you always feel bad about yourself after you eat all this food that you know you shouldn't. Or until you have to put on um, your fat pants or your fat, fat pants. <laughs> oh yeah. That, well, that was another reason I had to get out of EMS. I couldn't button my pants anymore. And I was like, well, I can't order new ones. So, <laughs> so I'm done. I really couldn't button my pants, but <laughs> yeah, it was a rough last like six months in EMS. I was like, mm. and, and I'm realizing that yes, that became my coping mechanism was all I, all I have to do is come home and eat whatever I want and not do anything else. I do like food too. Yeah. I mean, it's great. Who doesn't? Yeah. I'm not going to say anything. Especially had... if you're in the South too. Like it's. This is better there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had six donuts yesterday. But I do understand that, like, I'm not fucking getting new pants. I do understand that. <laughs> like, I'm not. I'm it. I refuse to get new pants. Because if you get new pants and they get tight, then you're just like, I hate my life. Fuck it. <laughs> and that, yeah, it's such a revolving door, too. You're like, well, none of my pants fit, so I might as well eat more. <laughs> <laughs> It'll at least she be She speaks happy nothing but the truth. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was definitely my thing. Hardcore. Well, Taylor, um, seriously, it's been a blast having you on. And, you know, like Jeremy and I said earlier, it's it's nice to just hear the honest, I don't fucking know. Like, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, Final thoughts going forward. What are, what are your, some of your final thoughts from this episode? I need to meditate and not eat so much. <laughs> Well, um, I, I won't say not eat so much, just eat the right things. Yeah. And but that's the, they but don't taste good. They don't Jeremy. bring me joy. <laughs> <laughs> Broccoli is not exciting to me. I want six donuts. Well, I mean, you could do broccoli. We're with friends now. Sorry. You and I are friends now. Broccoli with crushed <laughs> red pepper and honey. Not a donut. It's not a donut. No, it's not a donut. <laughs> But it's still whatever. You think you could shape it like a donut? I bet you could. Give us the give us the evidence and then get back to us. Because I'm on her page. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no. Can okay. you also make it taste like a donut and smell yeah. like? A donut? <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. No, it yeah, really no. is. Again, like you said before, I am definitely very much still on my journey of not only figuring out how to get back to like a mental headspace where I feel okay with me and what I'm doing in my life, but also like, what am I going to do in my life? 
Um, and I, you know, it, it's another reminder that I'm not there, you know, this episode and talking to you guys and that I still need to work on it. And I need to take more steps to get where I want and need to be. Um, so I do appreciate that. Yeah. Great. Just, just look at it as tools in the toolbox. Yeah, absolutely. You know, let's just put more stuff in your bag, more things you can pull out and use. We'll have you have you back on in a year. What do you say? All right. We'll see. Maybe, yeah, maybe I'll be coming at you live from, again, my beach bar. Who knows? <laughs> God, is Taylor drunk for this episode? Shit. <laughs> sounds sounds like we'll have to do that one on location. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're going to do that oh, one. Oh, yeah. 100%. I, I'm here. For, I have a spare room. You all can bunk up. <laughs> no, he snores so bad. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's then. not Sorry. even funny. <laughs> it's because of all the stress, Jeremy. Right, uh, right. It's the stress. You can get you a CPAP while you're here. I know plenty of people who use them. We'll get you one. Yeah, we we have a running joke that you should be uh, as soon as you graduate the fire academy, you should be issued a CPAP along with your oh, yeah. turnout gear and all of that stuff. That should be one of the things that you just get furnished with. Your SCBA should just double as a CPAP. <laughs> there you go. I like it. Somebody <laughs> should do that. See, I, I, I am that patient though that she maybe knows. That's what well. I'll do it in here. Yeah. Maybe, <laughs> do you have a CPAP? Maybe that'll yeah. be, <laughs> there that'll be my new life. <laughs> Getting firefighters to wear CPAPs. Yeah, let me know how that goes. <laughs> we are the patient. Do you oh, have a CPAP? Yeah. yeah. Do you wear it? No. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen that thing in three years. <laughs> I used the hose for a funnel because I was out of one when I was fixing the car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. The mask works real well. <laughs> oh, Jeremy, final thoughts. You know what that means? What? You get to close the show. I've just accepted it at this yeah. point. Good man. Uh, no, I, Taylor, thanks so much for coming on and uh, sharing with us and being so open and honest with us about where you're at and where you still, you know, you want to get further on and, yeah. you know, the willingness to take some steps and do some things and being self-aware about it, I think is huge. Um, you know, we talk a lot on this podcast and ab about mental health and, you know, we share some success stories and all of that stuff. And, Sometimes it can get to the whole, it's doom and gloom and everything is terrible and the job sucks and, you know, you can't do this and be a healthy person and all of that stuff. And we really are trying going forward to really kind of highlight that whole, you can do the job, you can be a healthy person, you know, and if you want to leave the job, that's fine too of and being self-aware enough to go, look, this isn't for me anymore and going and doing something else and continuing on, you know, I, the thing that irritates me, one of the things that irritate me the most is whenever someone has an issue like this, like they've got PTSD or depression or something like that, people tend to write them off and you become the diagnosis, you know, of, oh, you're, you've got PTSD, so you're broken. And you can't ever do anything ever again. That's 100% bullshit. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you break your leg, you either get put in a cast or you go have surgery or whatever. And then you're bet you know, unless you heal a, up. Unless you're a horse. Oh, yeah. Really? Why do you got to <laughs> rain on? <laughs> Fucking parade rainer. <laughs> That's what you are. Luckily, we're not horses, though. Yeah. So, <laughs> so but, you know, we, we can we can go through these things and come out the other side. And a lot of the times you can be a better person by coming out the other side of these things, because you're more self-aware you're able to recognize this stuff in other people and help other people with it just by sharing your story. Like you have already, there's no telling and you'll never know how many people that you've helped or encouraged to take a look at themselves and go, you know what? I think I might start, you know, I might be going down that road. There's some, some stuff I need to do, some things I need to work on. And 
that's the whole reason that we even started this podcast because we've both been through our shit. We've both been yeah. way down. And, you know, if I can help one person, just one to not get that far down the road, that's a win. And that makes all of this worth it. So thank you again for sharing. So that's my thank final you thoughts. Guys. Taylor, you're, I don't know if you've heard this today, this week, this month. You're a good person. Thank you. And uh, you will always have Jeremy and I as part of your network, no matter where in the country you decide to go based off some fucking TV show. <laughs> I just don't no watch Chicago no Fire. Oh, God. <laughs> LAPD. Yeah. <laughs> or if you do that, star, if you decide to go somewhere, just make it fucking cool. So if we do come visit you, it will at least be fun. <laughs> yeah. But in all in all seriousness, um, thank you. Thank you for just coming on the episode and being you. That's yeah. that's all we can ever ask for. Um well, again, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Never uh, somewhere I thought I would be doing something like this. So first for everything. Yeah. yeah. Who knows? Maybe you'll start your own podcast. Yeah. Probably not, but maybe. <laughs> Ask you later. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Well, everybody, thank you for coming to the Washdown podcast tonight. Um, like we've talked about in every episode and so many times tonight, if you're struggling, reach out. There are resources available. That sometimes they're right in front of your face. Sometimes they're not, but just search hard for them and they are always there. Um, oh, crap. What was the other part? I was doing so good. So this is, I never closed the show. So I was trying. No, you're, you're killing it. If you know somebody. Oh, if you know somebody that's struggling, reach out. I felt like oh, there was something else he said. Uh, do you happen to post like the suicide national suicide prevention hotline on anything? Um, occasionally, it, um, yeah, it uh, gets posted um, sometimes on the show notes. Um, not all the time. Um, that's nine eight eight for everybody if you're struggling. So, yeah, if you know somebody that's struggling, reach out, let them know you care. That was it. That was it. You're doing so good. Keep going. Yeah. So, <laughs> anyway, thanks, Taylor. Thanks, everybody, for stopping by. Um, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>